What is a function? We see them all the time in maths. Can someone just tell me two properties that a function has? Well, what does a function look like? It looks like this. A function looks like this. A toaster. You put something into the function and it gets changed in some way and something comes out. So sometimes, because toasters take too long to draw, when we're doing functions in maths, we just draw them as like a box. And we draw the arrows for the pieces of bread or whatever it is that comes in, and the crumbs that come, the thing that comes out, comes out the other side. So this is how I'm going to draw a function from now on. Now what makes a function a function? It does the same thing every time. Thank you. Number one, for same inputs, it gives same Output. No, they're not functions. A function for the same inputs gives the same output. There's no free will, there's no choice, there's no creativity, there's no qualitativeness here. You put in a 3 and a 2 and you get out a 5. I'm thinking of a plus function here. You put a 3 and 2 into that function, you get out a 5. You put a 3 and 2 in tomorrow, it'll still get you 5. There's no way you can change that. It's always 3 and 2 gives 5. So that's fundamental property number one about functions. What's fundamental property number two about functions? They've only got one output. Yeah, uh, you can put multiple inputs in, including none, and you only ever get one output out. Though that output can be a, a collection of things, but it's just one. Yeah, um, maybe we could write a, a variable number of things going in, but exactly one coming out. Yep. And can anyone think of another part? Another thing that's really important for functions. Yes. Ah, you can call it from anywhere. Um, are you sort of saying, it doesn't matter where you use it, it always does the same thing? It's independent of its context? Yes. Is that what you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. This was what makes them good building blocks, like pieces of Lego. It doesn't matter where you are, this function always does the same thing if it's in Sahara or in this function, or if it's embedded in that function, or if it's in the bottom of the ocean, or wherever it is, it always does the same thing. So you can move it around without changing its behavior. Yep, and in a sense, that's condition one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I catch what you were saying? Is that it? Yeah, yeah. The other thing I'm hunting for is, um, I see lots of hands, but I'll, just because we're in a hurry, I won't, but I'm sure you, you know it, or you have other interesting things to say. For all inputs that are legal to put into it, however that's defined, it's got to give you a legal output. Eventually. So it's no good if it just says, if you give it the stuff and it says, hmm, I'll think about that, but it either crashes or explodes or just never gives you an answer. If that happens, we call that a partial function. We say it's undefined on those inputs. Now, how does it compute it? How does it make this new thing? Normally just by following mindless instructions. For example, our 4004 chip, given a program, executes it and gives some output. Yeah, 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 it just follows mindless instructions. Different sets of instructions give you different functions. Let's go back to the pianola piano. You got a piano, you stick the piano roll in it. What do you get out? Beautiful music. You get another piano roll, you stick it in, what do you get? You stick the same piano roll in again, what do you get? The same music. Every time you stick the same piano roll in, you get the same music. Every time you stick a legal piano roll in, you get music. What is it? It's a function. We were asking if the player piano was a computer. I don't know if it's a computer, but it's certainly a function. And any function whose output can be calculated by an algorithm, in this case, a mechanical algorithm playing it, but in our case, running a 4003 or something like that, if a function can be computed by an algorithm, if it can be calculated by you with pencil and paper, we call it a computable function. And there's this famous result called the Church-Turing hypothesis by a brilliant logician called Alonzo Church and um, uh, Turing, I don't know who that guy was, uh, just joking, Alan Turing, brilliant mathematician, um, and the Church-Turing hypothesis says this. If you can work out a function using pen and paper, say the function plus. You guys, if I gave you two numbers, you could work it out with pen and paper, yeah, yeah? It doesn't matter what numbers I give you, as long as they're finite, you can get it. It might take you a long period of time, and you might need a lot of paper, but you can get the answer. If you can work it out with pen and paper, it's a computable function. 
Yep, if you can compute it, it's computable. The church Turing hypothesis is this. It can't be proved. No one's ever proved it, but no one's ever disproved it. We believe it in our hearts, though. Yeah. Is if it can be done by, if something's a computable function by any method, then it's a computable function by every method. So if you have some notion of computation, maybe your notion of computation is runs on a 4003. Maybe your notion of computation is runs on my iPhone. Runs in Windows. Runs using BASIC. You can write a C program. If you can write a C program to do it, it's computable. You say, no, if I can explain to my little brother how to do it with pen and paper, it's computable. You say, if I can train a, a room full of monkeys to work it out, it's computable. And you say, if I can build a clockwork machine to work it out, it's computable. The Church-Turing hypothesis says that all of those methods are really equivalent. You're not going to get different definitions of computable functions from those methods, provided that you're not picking something stupid. Now, provided it's a little bit powerful, your notion of computation, like you can't say everything that an ant can work out is computable, because an ant can't work anything out. It's, it's pretty stupid. But if you had some, something a little bit more powerful than an ant, it turns out suddenly all the methods collapse into one. And it doesn't matter what your notion of computation is, they're all equivalent. Which means, if it's true, that it doesn't matter what computers they invent tomorrow, or new languages they invent tomorrow, or new ways of doing computing that they invent tomorrow, you'll only ever be able to do what we can do now. There's no new functions we can compute. We might be able to do it faster, or with more attractive smells, <laughs> but we're not going to be able to compute new things. In other words, we're really just getting a speeding up going on. Now, my question is, is the pianola piano a computer? Is it equivalent to the 4003? Is it equivalent to a room full of monkeys is it who can follow instructions? Well-trained monkeys. Or you with a piece of paper. Can you compute every function? Any function you can work out on a piece of paper, like I'm saying, work out if you use a leap year or not. You can now work that out on a piece of paper. Could you get a piano or a piano to work that out? Weren't they the first computers? Weren't they the first computers? Well, this not is not the question. Early computers did store things on paper, but don't confuse that with a piano or piano. They were a different machine reading the piece of paper. There's a fundamental difference between them that we're just trying to get up to. So can you see that a, a piano computes a function, a piano or piano computes a function, but it can't compute every function that we can compute. It just computes a particular one. And our notion of computer, so I would say no, it's not a computer. And I'd say our notion of computer is a machine that's general enough to compute every function that can be computed. And that includes your iPod, it includes you and a piece of paper, it includes the 4003 and the 4004, except they need a bit more memory, but it doesn't include a P and O. Okay, does that make sense? No, even with more memory, the piano can't do things like work out if something's a leap year. How can it work it out? You, you, tell me, you tell me a way, if you can think of a way I can do it, tell me. I mean, think of a way the piano would interpret the holes and playing notes that would answer that question for us. If you can do it, woohoo! You've discovered a musical computer. <laughs>Someone was trying to run the sample code during the break then. They were compiling something and trying it out. Can I just say, awesome, everyone that did that, that's fantastic. Um, they found a problem, so let me explain what the problem was so you can work it out. They had said, quite reasonably, see if you can spot this, it's a very subtle error. But it follows on from exactly what we've been saying. So you, you know enough to spot it, but you might not. They something, said something like, um, if... Uh, year is less than max, oh no, assert, year is less than max. Then they said something like, if max um, is greater than, I don't know, they're saying something else. And at the top they'd said, hash Define max equals 1583. And they'd also said hash include cert.h. Now, without calling out, look at that and see if you can see what the problem is, because it's so subtle and everyone will make this problem mistake 50 times. If people are waving, have you made this mistake yourself in the past? Is that why you're smiling? 
No? I haven't. But you, um, so we, as you said, it reads down. Reads down? So you need to see, so the order in which you have it. Oh, the order in which you put it is important, but in this case, these two don't interact with each other. So our normal convention is we put hash includes at the top. That's our convention in the course, and hash defines under. But even if you write them upside down, in this case, it'll work fine, as long as there's nothing in this file that uses the word max, because if there was, it'll stick it in, then replace it. Or possibly will. I don't know. Find out. Uh, yes? You put a on it. Yes! Here's what happens. Hash defines are funny things. They don't happen at runtime. They happen at compile time. And everywhere in the program the word max appears, it's replaced by what comes after it. So it was, this line was converted into, but you never get to see it because the precompiler does it, assert year is le great less than equals 1583 semicolon. Does that make sense? Well, it doesn't. <laughs> it's the problem. So you need to not put the equals in because you're not assigning it. You're saying this this, wherever you see this, replace it with this, and it, not put the semicolon there. And I've done that myself many times. Normally when I'm flipping back from another language to C, I forget about that. Does that make sense? Yes. What does the semicolon usually do? The semicolon marks the end of a line, in, um, at the end of a statement in a C program. So you put it at the end of every line. We also drop each line to new lines. So you'd think C would know enough without the semicolons to know it's a new line, but it just needs the... That's the natural question. It's a good one to ask. It doesn't care about new lines. You could write your whole program on one line. Don't do that. <laughs> but you're good. You could, because some people really like making their programs short. So you could say, man, I solved that whole assignment in one line. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, another question someone asked in the break is, oh, yeah? Um, just further, continuing on to that. Yes. If you're writing like an if statement or something, if your line like exceeds that width, can you just do enter and it'll continue? Yes, that's a good question. You shouldn't have your lines too long um, for a range of reasons, not least of which is that you can only display a certain amount on the screen at a time, and the things that are off the side of the screen, if you had a ridiculously long line and you're looking at your program, you're only looking at a little window of it, there's a whole lot of it you can't see. Where's the error going to be? And the stuff you can't see. You want everything visible so you can see those errors. So um, we reckon that most people can view code and other people will be looking at your code, not just you. Like Rupert, one of the tutors here, has a really wide monitor at home. Uh, and for many years, he used to write like 700 line wide programs, character wide programs, because he could see them at home. But as soon as he gave them to anyone else to look at, they could only see like a small window of them at a time. Uh, and after a while, um, he stopped doing that because he realized. But of course, you wouldn't realize it normally. So we reckon that most people are viewing it on a device that can display 72 characters. That's sort of the standard. So we suggest your lines not exceed 72 characters unless, um, unless you really want to and you have a really good reason. But it has to be a really good reason. Um, and how do you break them? Well, because C doesn't um, care about line, new lines, you could just break them at any natural point. So if you had a really long, if x is greater than 100, and here's how you write and, except I don't know how to do ampersands. So I'll just write it like that. Uh, x is greater than 100 and y is greater than 50. And, oh, I can't go anymore. I'm, I'm going to fall off the side of the screen. I'll just drop to the next line. And z is greater than 57. And x is not equal to. Here's how you write not equal to. Someone asked me that. x is not equal to... Um, uh, 9,000. Yep, so I just broke it there, and it's sort of a natural place to break. You probably wouldn't want to break it here. That'd be an ugly spot to break. Yep. And so you'll just ignore the line breaks. But so a lot of you haven't compiled anything. And you might be thinking, oh, I haven't compiled anything. Rich is talking about compiling in lectures. Oh, I hope my tutor shows me how to compile really soon. Um, but don't think like that, because your tutor eventually will show you how to compile. But that's not a really good way of approaching uni. The way to approach uni is, if I give you a bit of code and say this compiles, what do I just assume that everyone will do tonight? Take it home and compile it. And then change it. And fiddle with it. And diddle with it. And you're probably not used to that. At school, the teacher probably tells you what to do at every stage. Everything will seem weird and strange for a while until you get used to it. And the only way of getting used to it is doing it. 
So if it seems weird and strange, don't freak out. It seems weird and strange to everyone. But go home and try and make it work. And if it doesn't work, just ask questions. Ask questions on the forum, ask questions of you, ask questions of me, ask questions of the person you're sitting next to. But don't wait for us to explain everything to you, because we probably won't, because there isn't enough time, and that's not what we're trying to do. We'll explain everything you can't get, but we're assuming you're at home experimenting and fiddling all the time. So I'm assuming everyone will go home tonight and type in that code I put there and make it compile and then work out how to change it and fiddle it and get it to work for leap years and change the definition of leap year and check it still works and that sort of stuff, that's just looking after your own learning. That's what I want you to be doing all the time and I'm rem it's remiss of me not to have mentioned that. So quite possibly you've had a really lovely week not doing anything, just waiting for someone to show you what to do. Stop that now, don't panic, you've got heaps of time, but start trying to make things work and happen and compile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the only way you're going to learn is by trying to make things compile. And just do stuff and ask questions and do stuff and ask questions and fiddle and diddle. And it won't work at first. But get stuck into it now so you get that bit out of the way so in three or four weeks' time everything's cool. Yes? You waited so long, didn't you? Your hands, you're actually redder on this side than on that side. Whenever I have a problem, you know, I just Yeah, yeah. Whenever you have a problem, you Google. I like that. I thought you were going to say, whenever I have a problem, I give up and I get really stressed. That's awesome. Well done. Well, what's the difference between C, C plus, and C plus um, plus? They're sort of the same. The C plus is no such thing, I don't think. There's a Microsoft thing called C sharp or something. Just, yeah, if you ever see that, just go like this. Um, so, yeah, C and C plus plus are essentially the same. C plus plus is the language C with a few extra bits added, and the rules change very slightly. And most people out there writing big systems, or many people, write them in C++ rather than C. But of course, they're writing C. They, and they have a few extra commands under their belt that you don't have. So if you went to a place that told you how to do it in C++, it's probably going to work in C as well. Just try and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, plus plus is quite cool. Can I tell you what plus? No, I, I'll tell you plus plus. If you had a variable called x, and you wrote plus plus after it, you know what that does? It increases x by 1. It saves you having to increase x. It's like that command in the 4004 to increase a register by 1. This does that. increases x by 1. So if you wrote that as a line of code, x++, plus plus, it'll increase x by 1. Now, the other thing that will help people, because I do a lot of talking in the lectures, and I notice very few people are taking notes. So maybe you'll go home and think, oh, I've forgotten everything he said. Someone somewhere is writing down, if you say x++, plus plus, it increases x by 1. And how grateful you'll be to those people when you see those course notes. But make sure, don't hit this weekend without you having compiled something and fiddled with it. And then to teach yourself, see, keep compiling and fiddling. I'd put an hour or two aside every week just for compiling and fiddling. Uh, and just relax, everything's fine, still got heaps of time, but get stuck into it now. You don't want to get caught later on not having done it. By now I'm expecting everyone to have compiled something. Functions we were talking about before. As someone said, uh, is the Church Turing thesis examinable? But I think the reason they're asking that question is, do I need to understand what you're saying about the church Turing hypothesis? And the answer is, yeah, 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 you need to understand everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the church Turing hypothesis, just look it up on Wikipedia, just essentially says all you need to know about it is, uh, it's about this notion of what it is to be a computer. You don't have to understand all the ins and outs, you just have to understand the notion of, the notion of what it is to be a computer is to somehow be able to compute all computable functions. The details at the moment aren't important. The important thing at the moment to understand is, there is a notion of what it is to be a function, and there's a notion of what it is to be a computer, and the two things are related. A computer should be something that can compute all functions that can be computed, yeah, given enough time and space. Uh, now, I wanted to compute an actual function with you guys now. Here's the function. You know I was grumbling before about the confusion of working out how many days it is till the next Thursday. If I was to tell you a random date, like, I don't know, April 1st, coming up, how many days is it after April 1st till the next Thursday? It depends what? Oh, April 1st this year. Six. Six. How did you work it out? Good man. Well done. I like that. If you wanted to solve the problem of calculating how many days it was, uh, I'm going to draw the function on the board, so I'm not just speaking in words, so we're speaking in pictures. Here's a function called next Thursday. It takes in a date. It puts out an int. 
which is a num and it tells you, given a date, which is a day and a month and a year, it tells you how many days until the next Thursday. That seems like a daunting function to work out, even if I just asked you to work it out on pen and paper. Heaven forbid you'd have to write a computer program to do that, but how would you even do it on pen and paper? How would you solve that problem? Given a date, work out how many days, to, well, let's ask the person at the back, how did you work it out? Well, no, the calendar didn't tell you how many days it was till next Thursday. I counted. Ah. Actually, I counted in reverse because it's a Friday. It's still okay, so you did it, I believe, you probably broke it, this problem into two problems without even realizing it because we're very good problem solvers as human beings. And whenever we see a hard problem, we try and break it into sub-problems. What were the two problems you broke it into? Yeah, what day of the week is the 1st of April? And then how many days from that day of the week till the next Thursday? That's how we're going to solve problems. I'm just wandering around aimlessly, it might look like it, because I can't find the eraser for the board. <laughs> ah, there it is, right next to the board. <laughs> so suppose we want to solve this problem. It's a daunting problem, the next Thursday problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to break it into two, two parts. We're going to say, easy. What we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to have a problem that says, what day of the week is it? And then what's that going to take in? A date. Oh, what is a date? Well, let's say a date's three numbers, because so far we only know numbers in C. So it's a year, a month, and a day. And it's going to put out, well, so far we only know numbers in C, so what's it going to put out? A number. <laughs> How are you going to record what day of the week it is using a number? Zero for Thursday. All right, let's say uh, zero is Thursday, one is Friday, two is Saturday, da 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 da, -da up to seven is uh, Wednesday. Ah, so I think I see what you're saying, but can I paraphrase the general approach you're taking, which is, Let's come up with a less intuitive numbering system to make the final calculation easier. But I put it to you, and that's a very sensible design decision to make. What we have to weigh out when we do that is, what's the cost of having a less obvious numbering system versus what's the cost of having a more complex calculation? And I reckon calculating it both ways is pretty straightforward though I agree it is slightly easier, perhaps, if you count the numbers backwards. But getting this backwards, saying that as you increase in days, the day number goes down, I reckon that's, I reckon that's, that's so confusing that every time I looked at the program, I'd have to think, oh, I can't use my normal notion of days. I have to remember times going backwards when I number these days. Or I just have to think. And whenever I have to think when I look at a program, it makes me nervous. No, yeah, I know, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. But what I'm saying is to do that, you're going to have to represent the days of the week by numbers. And your way of representing them is not the obvious way of representing them. Even though it's the obvious way for solving this problem, it's just not the obvious way to think about days of the week. If I said to you, Friday is four, what's Saturday? What would you say? <laughs> Friday is four, what's Saturday? Saturday? No, you're not thinking that. If I just ask you on the street, if I just, I'm just going to ask someone, hey, um, <laughs> Friday's four, what's, yes, they said that. <laughs> if you say Friday's four, uh, then, uh, then I think people would say Saturday was five. And if you said Tuesday was three, I think people would say Wednesday was four. I just think it's a natural way of writing it. So I agree, there's, there's trade-offs to be made, but let's, I'm going to represent it in the more natural way, even though that's going to give us a harder calc at the end. But let's see, and if the calc's so horrible, then I'm happy to go back and make this more confusing. But yeah. Okay, so I'm going to store the day as an integer using an encoding like this. And I'm going to say, I've got a what day of the week is it function, and then I've got another uh, days till next Thursday function, and that takes in day of the week, which is an integer and puts out an integer, which is days to next Thursday. Now, do you agree if you had these two functions, you could put them together and solve the problem? Yeah. This is how we always solve problems in computing. 
We look at this big problem and it scares us and we think, man, this is freaking me out completely. So we relax and we say, okay, I can't solve that big problem, but I'm going to break it into sub-problems. And I'm going to solve those. And although those sub-problems themselves might be hard, they're a bit less hard and I feel a bit less tense. And I'll break, if any of those sub-problems are hard, I'll break it into sub-sub-problems and sub-sub-sub-problems and so on and so on. And then being an incredibly lazy person who likes to give myself shots in the arm and moral encouragement, which of these two problems will I write, will I solve first? Second, because it looks so easy, doesn't it? It looks really easy, especially now you know the mod function, the percent function, the remainder function. Remember that per percent function we did? If I said 7% 2, remember? That is, what's the remainder of 7 divided by 2? What's 7% 2? 1. Yeah, okay. Uh, 2 goes into, 7% uh, uh, 2 means 7 divided by 2 is 3, remainder 1. Yep, that's right. So that'll tell me if seven's even or odd. By using this remainder function, I reckon I can, given the days, the day number, I can work out how many days it is till the next one. But this one looks very hard. What day of the week it is? Who thinks that's hard? Yeah. <clears throat> you could do seven minus the input. The only problem there is, yeah, it is seven minus the input, but what's the problem? Yeah, it depends how we define next Thursday. So if we say next Thursday means even if today's Thursday, next Thursday's in seven days' time. Yeah, let's define next Thursday to be that. We've got a bit of flexibility with the problem definition here. So yeah, okay. So this function's the easiest function in the world. It's, if this input's x, the answer is the function computes seven minus x. What's our assert going to be here, by the way? At the beginning. Assert x is less than or equal to seven. And assert x is greater than zero. Okay, cool. Greater than or equal to zero. Uh, it's not equal to seven. Did we go, in, go down to six? Oh, yeah, thank you very much. But this other function looks hard. What day of the week is it? How can you work that out? Well, there's this cool method invented by this guy called Con Conway, who's a fantastic mathematician who I really love. And Conway's method is called the doomsday method. And here's how it works. It goes something like this. Uh, he noticed that the fourth of the fourth and the 6th of the 6th, and the 8th of the 8th, and the 10th of the 10th, and the 12th of the 12th are always on the same day every year. And that day this year is Monday. So if I said to you, what's the 12th of December this year, you'd say, Monday. And if I said to you, what's the 10th of April this year, you'd say, April, the fourth month. 10th of April? Yeah, what's the 10th of April? What day of the week is that? Well, we know the 4th of the 4th is a Monday. So the 4th of April is a Monday, so it's six days after that. Yeah, that's a, uh, Sunday. 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 Yeah, that's right. Okay, so that's a very fast way of computing which day of the month it is for the months that are the 4th or the 8th or the 6th or the 10th or the 12th. He also noticed this, that that same day, which he called the doomsday, every year has a doomsday, the doomsday for this year is Monday, the 4th of the 4th is the same day as the 9th of the 5th, and the 5th of the 9th, and the 7th of the 11th, and the 11th of the 7th. Which I always remember by saying, as everyone does, I work 9 to 5 at the 7-Eleven. <laughs> so the only day we're missing is to notice that the 0th of March is the doomsday as well. So what day was the 1st of March this year? Tuesday. What day was the last day of February this year? Monday. Because the 0th of March is the Monday. Okay. Is the last day of Feb. Does that make sense? Uh, now, there is a problem. We have to work out if we use a leap year or not. Um, but we have a function to do that, so we can work that out. And we have to work out which day for each year is the doomsday for that year. So now you can hopefully compute what day of the week it is for any day this year. Let me just give you some as a warm-up. What's the first of the tenth this year? Saturday, I reckon. The first of the tenth is um, nine days before the tenth of the tenth. Nine days is the same as two days, because in weeks, isn't it? Because nine is a week and two days. So it's the day two days before the doomsday. The doomsday was a Monday, so it's not the Sunday, it's the Saturday. What's, is, can someone check? The guy with the calendar. First of the tenth. Is it a... Saturday? Yep, someone's checked. 
What about the 9th of the 9th? 9th of the 9th? Remember, I work 9 to 5. So the 5th of the 9th is a Monday. So the 9th of the 9th is four days later. What's four days later than a Monday? Friday. Friday. And is it? Is the 9th of the 9th a Friday? Yeah. Someone tell me your birthday. Who's, who's got a birthday? I can work out what your birthday is. Yes. 9th of the 9th. 9th of the 9th. Your birthday is Friday. Well done. Uh, Christmas this year is Sunday. So now you can just very quickly work out what day of the week any day of the year is. Andrew? 29th of February. 29th of February? Oh, good man. Doomsday. Oh, hang on. Oh, no, that's confusing. <laughs> there is no 29th of February this year. Is that really your birthday? Wow. Wow, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Okay. Anyone else born on the 29th of February here? Chances are. Anyone born on the 29th of Feb? No. No. Actually, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the doomsday method. So you might want to look that up. Now, the only trick is working out what the doomsday for each year is. How many days are there in a year? 365. And a quarter. Yeah, let's forget that. Let's suppose that in a non-leap year, let's suppose it's 365. So how, how's that divisible by seven? If you had to divide that among seven children, what's your remainder? 365 mod seven. What's the remainder? One. That means every year the doomsday moves on by one. You probably notice that. If it's the 10th of the 10th is a Monday this year, then next year it'll be a Tuesday. And next year it'll be a Wednesday. Unless it's a leap year, in which case it'll be a... Thursday. Yep. So we just need to know the doomsday increases by one every year, except when there's a leap year, it increases by two. So if we knew the doomsday for the year zero, which I happen to know was a Tuesday, then all I need to know is how many years we are since the year zero. And that tells me how many days it's advanced if we didn't have leap years. And then I just need to add in how many leap years we've had since then, which is easy enough because there's been one every four years. So I divide it by four and round down. Oh, except I lose one every 100 years, so I divide, I subtract the number of years it is divided by 100, I mean, mod 100, rounded down. Oh, except I get an extra one every 400 years, so I add back in the number of years it is mod 100, mod 400, <laughs> rounded down. Uh, mod or divided by? Uh, divided by, divided by, rounded down. Was I saying mod? Yeah, sorry guys. Does that make sense? I don't expect you to memorize what I just said. I just want you to understand the method. You could do that, yeah. You could just compute totally the number of days if you had a computer. But this way, you can do it in your head. 